I was always a Pittsburgh baseball fan. It goes back when, when I was just a young kid. Last hit a ball. Just fed into you and you absorbed it. And lived it. We were always in Forbes Field. First as young fans. Every Saturday was a kid's day. It was free and uh, we all went. Then as workers. I started in 1936. I've been an usher since 1948. And all the while, as witnesses to history. The seventh and decisive battle in the world's championship. I was working on the third base side, and I remember every moment of it. And then when he hit the home run, this place was in Bedlam. Win 10 to 9 to become the new baseball champions of the world. I didn't know what to do, you know. But 95 year old Phil Coyne and his fellow ushers have done and seen just about everything as it relates to Pirates baseball. Now, from their favorite players. When Ty Trainer became a player and a coach. Bill Mazeroski. Roberto Clemente. He was one of the greatest. To Marquee Games two all-star games who were a series there. And three different ballparks. And we walked in and I looked up and I said, oh my God, this is huge compared to Forbes Field. You know, it had double the seating. This is the best ballpark. You can sit here in this, at, at, in the, at night and stand here and watch the city. We made it at Forbes. We made it at Three Rivers, and now we're making it at PNC. This is Pirates history from a different view, as five ushers who go way back share their stories from the stands. 27B. On a rainy night in Pittsburgh, 95-year-old Phil Coyne is manning his usual post at PNC Park. There we are. Thank you. Sections 26 and 27 on third base side. Ooh, that looks good. <laughs> he still works with enthusiasm, as if it's his first day on the job. Trade you. <laughs> Thank you. But he's no rookie. This is Phil's 77th season working as an usher for the Pirates, but his love for the team goes back even further. I grew up in Oakland about six blocks away from Forbes Field. And the son of Irish immigrants quickly became enthralled by the great American pastime. Were you a big baseball fan growing up? Well, we had to be because we were always in Forbes Field on Saturdays. Right field stands was open to all, all the kids. They called it Kids Day and it was free and uh, we all went then. So from the time you were 10 years old and somebody older on the, in the block brought you, why well, you, uh, you would go to the games. And eventually work there too. Everybody from Oakland was an usher, and you always went through Forbes Field before you went out to work for your own, on your own. I started in 1936 when the uh, Social Security came in. Did you think you had the greatest job in the world? I did have the greatest job in the world. Yeah, it was good. In those days, the man in charge of the ushers was a store owner from Oakland named Gus Miller. But just because an usher showed up to work didn't mean he would make the payroll. It all depended on the attendance at the game. Well, some days you, weren't, you wouldn't work, but you would just stay and watch the game. And uh, uh, old Gus had a, had a thing in them days. When you didn't work, you went out to the field and you tried to get the foul balls that come into the stands. And when you got a foul ball to the stands, you took it over and you were guaranteed to work the next day. The balls were used again in batting practices and games. And more than a decade after Phil became a regular on the payroll, there we are. Thank you. two other young ushers showed up among the masses, Tony Greco and Guy Buddy Diolis. There you go. Both started working in 1948, around the age of 16. 
Tony grew up in the Homewood Brushton area, listening to every game on the radio. I was a Pirate fan, and I, it goes back when, when I was just a young kid. And what I really enjoyed, listening to the radio and listening to Rosie Rosewell. Uh, one of the things I remember the most is when a home run was hit. And he would say, Aunt Minnie, here it comes. Then all of a sudden you'd hear a window break. And it, it was exciting. For Guy, a quick walk up the street was all it took to see a Pirates game. I was very fortunate to grow up Panther Hollow in Oakland. So I was following them for a long time until I started to work at the age of 16. I had a brother that worked at Forbes Field. And he asked me if I wanted to come down. I said, sure, I'll try it. I mean, I was just a young pipsqueak. There you go, sir. All right, thank you. Enjoy. Guy, too, was excited to follow in the footsteps of so many of his relatives and friends. So it was a real true way of life for all of us. An enjoyable one, if I may add again. It was just another home for all of us. You know. It was another home for Joe O'Toole's family, too. Joe's father and uncle were longtime ushers. Joe is now the president of the ushers union, but he didn't join the ranks right away. He started by cleaning the clubhouse. That led to a job as visiting Bat Boy in 1953. Joe was 13. I was a Bat Boy for Stan Usual. Guys like Gil Hodges. Willie Mays, um, uh, Sandy Koufax. And for a moment, it looked as though Joe might become famous too, after a photographer approached him on the field one day. And he said, we're going to do a cover for a magazine. We're going to have Mil Willie Mays on it. We'd like you to be on it, handing him a bat. And I said, fine. Next day I go out, and the photographer said to me, you know what, we're just going to do Willie Mays by himself. And I was like, oh, I was a little disappointed, but years later, I'm thinking, I could have been on the cover, I think it was Look Magazine, with Willie Mays, one of the all-time greats. I could go back, I'd have tried to twist his arm a little bit <laughs> to get it done. <laughs> a few years later, Joe became an usher, but near the bottom of the seniority list, he didn't always work in the stands. They had a manual scoreboard in Forbes Field. It was one of the last jobs when, you, if you got on, you might go out there with the guys that worked out there on a regular basis. And they had prize days where they had a pony out inside the lobby. And I, I, there were games I stood there and watched the pony. So a real pony. A real pony, yes. You would babysit the pony. Yes, yes. And there you go. As Joe was earning his stripes, another future usher was growing up more than 100 miles away from Forbes Field. You guys have a Hugo. You have a good evening. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. for coming. Yeah, yeah. All right. Robert Taylor Sr. Yeah, Robert's father was a ticket taker at the ballpark. I lived in West Virginia, but every summer I spend the summer here in Pittsburgh with my father. I always liked baseball because I played baseball during high school in uh, Sandlock when I was growing up. I was here all the time. You know, I used to go to Forbes Field and, and uh, watch baseball games. And but Robert admits he wasn't prepared for his very first time at the ballpark. And most of the number of people one time I ever seen in my life in the first baseball game I went to. I said, oh my God, how did they get all these people in this place? Whoa, <laughs> it was just unbelievable. But as he got older, Robert decided it might be a great place to work. He became an usher at the age of 19 during the Pirates' last season at Forbes Field. When they run out of regular ushers, and I would get on then. That's how I got there. He got the idea, well, you may as well put an application in. That way you can be working all the time. And over time, as these ushers worked, they became encyclopedias of everything baseball. Sure, talk of the old days might include the hustle and bustle of Oakland. And them days, and everybody that came to the games, mostly all came with, by, uh, by streetcar. And some things that might surprise modern day fans. Really, you could just bring in your own beer? They brought it in telling you by the cases. But most conversations still begin with simply the massive size of Forbes Field. So it was an enormous pitcher's ballpark. It seemed ultra large. You hit a home run, you really earned it. Here I think it says 410. Forbes Field was 457 feet and they actually pushed the batting cage all the way out there and that's where that batting cage stood. 
the batting cage, a flagpole, and sometimes, in the early days, even fans. At one time, St. Louis and uh, the uh, Giants would get such big crowds that they'd put some of the people on the field. They'd rope the field off on a Sunday afternoon. Phil says that happened a lot in 1936, a season where there was plenty to get excited about. 36 was the big one. Paul Wainer and Lloyd Wainer were in the, uh, Archie Vaughn was on, the, on short. Uh, the Gus Sewer was an old timer that played every day. Pie Trainer was a manager at that time. And uh, so there was a lot of enthusiasm there. He added a press box on top of the roof. And that was with the purpose of uh, bringing, you know, the, the, the filling the demand of the people coming in for the World Series. Unfortunately, the World Series never happened. They almost won the pennant and lost it to, to Chicago later, you know, in this season. But there would be plenty more great Pirates players and moments to come. A ball player named Del Long, I don't know if you recall him. He hit straight home runs at Forbesville, eight days in a row. I always enjoyed watching the great one, which was Roberto Clemente. And Stargell, he went over the Forbes Field roof for home run one year. And then there's the game that many still consider the greatest in Pirates history. I was working on the third base side, and I remember every moment of it. Push the ball down the left field line. I was upstairs in section 115 which would be up right behind home plate. Pirate fans are hopeful of a typical Buck rally. He's down front in the boxes. And I saw him swinging the bat, I saw him hitting the ball. And, and there she goes, it's a long one to left field that's heading for the wall. I watching Yogi Berra running back and looking up and the ball going over the wall and it was just mass hysteria. And the Pirates win 10-9 to, to become the new baseball champions of the world. This place was in Bedlam. We were supposed to keep people from running on the field, but that was an impossibility. I didn't even try. Instead, they celebrated with the players and the fans, with this iconic picture capturing the day. The man behind Bill Mazeroski was fellow usher, the late Dominic Wu Verratti. Joe O'Toole's father was in the picture, too. This was my father, Jimmy O'Toole. He went up, slapped Maz on the back, and then he backed out of the crowd because he knew it was going to be a crush. Okay, you know I wasn't there. I know you weren't there. I heard okay. that story. <laughs> it's very sad. Okay. Um, After working want, every other home game of the series, on this day of suspense and celebration, Joe had to work his full-time job at a local grocery store. But I was at work taking a break and saw it on TV, little black and white screen. Everybody in the place jumped up and down with the excitement. I just stood there and said, I should have been there. I should have been there. And it's probably the first or second greatest event sports-wise in the city. And I wasn't there. Taken by Maz, he's just on second for the final putout in the history of Forbes Field. A decade later, there was another event that changed sports in the city forever. Pittsburgh said goodbye to Forbes Field and hello to a brand new home. Three River Stadium. Pitt was getting so big and it was getting so crowded in Oakland that something had to be done. I mean, what I miss most of, instead of walking to work, I had to take a bus. <laughs> I had to take a bus to work. It was a melancholy time for many. Very sad, very sad, you know, because of where I came from. But it was also a time filled with excitement. And we walked in, and I looked up, and I said, oh, my God, this is huge compared to Forbes Field. You know, it had double the seating. But I went all the way up to the ramps to the fifth level, and I went up to the top, and I was holding on to the railing. It seemed like it was straight up and down because it was totally different. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really something. But I knew that, well, this place is bigger, and I'll get to work more because they're going to need more people. And uh, versus Forbes Field, there wasn't that many. And people came with good reason. The 70s brought an all-star game and two World Series. It was unbelievable. 
you know, you would see the guys that was playing then, the Stargells, the Parkers, the, the Clementes. They go out, the pitcher may give up three runs. There was nothing. Half inning, they may be up by 10. They called them the Lumber and Lightning. They didn't call them the Lumber Company. They called them that for a reason. I seen Willie Stargell hit balls up in the fifth level in, in Three Rivers Stadium. Just unbelievable. Sitting there and say, well, I'm getting paid to watch something that people would die to pay to see. That meant more to me than anything. By day, Robert was a steel worker. Phil, a machinist for Westinghouse Airbrake. Tony was a shoe buyer for Kaufman's department stores. Joe worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue. And Guy was a detective for Pittsburgh Police. The Pirates and the ballpark brought them together on nights and weekends. At that age and when I started, excitement. Strictly excitement. It was excitement until I got married and had children. Then it became necessary when I could work and I enjoyed, you know, making a few extra dollars. I don't know that you plan on a, a part-time job like this forever. A part-time job or a life-changing event. The 80s would bring a series of ups and downs for the Pirates, but for Tony Greco, they would bring something else, love. Yep, that's another uh, story there. That was at Three Rivers Stadium. She was uh, working with management there. A new employee named Joanne Funkhauser first caught Tony's ear. And my first job was to call the Astros to see if they were going to report to work. And Tony was one of the gentlemen I was able to call. And, and then I started talking to her then. In fa face to face? And what she would do, she would check with the supervisor because she had a, uh, a phone. And she would want to know what location I was. So she knew exactly where I was in the ballpark. So you're saying she stalked you? Well, I mean, it, <laughs> it's all, almost like a mutual, you know, feeling. That was 27 years ago. Then we got married two years later, so we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. If only life would have been as blissful for the Pirates during that time. We all know what happened after 1992. But by 2001, there was excitement about something else. Another new home for the Pirates. But it was a bit tough to say goodbye again when Three Rivers got imploded. When it went down, it felt like my heart stopped. It just hit me so much. And I realized that, that was 30 years of my life. I remember we went from Force Field over to Three Rivers to see the place. For me, it was a chunk of my life was now over. That's how I looked at it. I said, 30 years went by, like that, it was gone. But what took its place was pretty impressive. I had mixed emotions until I walked into this ballpark and it was all over. I knew they did the right thing. It's just one beautiful ballpark. Three Rivers, you was in this bowl, and in Oakland, you was all cluttered up. But right here, you can see, and you're sitting here watching a baseball game, and the, the lights of the city. And this is one of the most beautiful parks in the major leagues, and, and it really is. PNC Park brought lots of changes. Tony's section got an upgrade. He works behind home plate in the Lexus Club. There we are. Hey, thank you. And he can't help but to hobnob a bit while he's at it. For politicians, sports stars, and other notable people, it's a popular place to sit. It is one of the greatest, top shelf, a gentleman's gentleman, is Arnie Palmer. He is the greatest. Uh, he comes in there, and as soon as people see him coming in, they start lining up, wanting his autograph. And he carries his own black marker. He takes it out of his pocket and he signs the autograph. From celebrities to the youngest of fans, the ballpark has always been a place where friendships are made. I've had people for 40 years in, you know, attending to them and coming to the games. Meeting the people, well, I'm right down the front there at six and seven, and I have a few regulars. You begin to know them by name. And know everything about them in section eight, seat 12. That belongs to George Corey from Homer City, Indiana County. He's what you might call a super regular in Robert's section. He's missed only 19 home games in 46 years. Um, my wife used to say I like baseball better than her. I said, yeah, but I like you better in soccer, I used to tell her. <laughs> he come to every game. 
the coach would come and ask me if he's late, where's George? I said, well, if you didn't see the obituary that he died, he's going to be here. He even got caught in traffic or something. But Bob knows the strategy. He's just a baseball person. It's very nice. He gives me some of his snacks, and every once in a while I'll bring him a piece of apple pie. He loves it maybe once a month or something like that. From pie to pizza and so much more. Hey. How you doing? Man? How you doing? This is Tony and Joanne Greco's annual summer picnic. It's packed with relatives, neighbors, fellow ushers, and lots of pirate season ticket holders. I'm glad you're here. Glad to be here. <laughs> Lori McIntosh and her husband Chris made the trip to Allison Park from East Liverpool, Ohio. It's <laughs> Tony befriends everybody at PNC Park, and um, he just brings you in as part of uh, his group and uh, his family. And we ended up. I think this is our third annual picnic that we've attended, and we wouldn't miss it for anything. <laughs> We're going to raise that. Reg door. Brown struck up a friendship with Tony when he first sat in his section five years ago. Are you videotaping this? Or no, what? I don't know what they're doing. Obviously, he's very outgoing. He's very funny, and he just makes you feel so comfortable when you talk to him. He's such a he's such a great guy. He really is, and it really is like family. When we had to pick this just to stand out here and look well, towards home plate. Yeah. A family with new members and those who go way, way back. On this day, Guy and Phil take a walk past part of the Forbes Field wall that's still standing in Oakland. I have to laugh because Phil might have been working when I was in there on Kids Day. <laughs> they reminisce at the spot where Maz's home run cleared the wall. They put that in there. And, and we visit home plate in its original spot. Only now it's in the middle of Pitt's Pazvar Hall. A friendly hello leads to a conversation with tourists. How much was a hot dog? Yeah. A dime. A dime. <laughs> oh, geez, and, oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. It costs $11 for a World Series ticket from the box seat. Yeah. 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 God, you can't get a beer almost for that. Yeah. No, 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 back no. then you went outside and got a beer. Oh, they they Phil they calls it the tour them. of... The things that are, are were and aren't no more, you know. Things that were a big part of their lives. I feel more than fortunate, just blessed, you know, that I did what I did, you know, and saw what I saw. Do you watch the game as you work? Oh, you always watch the game. And Phil Coyne has watched more games than any other usher working today. When he first started ushering back in 1936, he was somewhere in the high 400s on the seniority list. Today, he's number one. Did you ever think he would be number one? Oh, no, no, no. It, well, the Lord's been good to me, you know. I just never have no problems. Get up in the morning and do whatever I'm supposed to do, and that's it. Rain or shine, he's always happy to be at the ballpark. It's the exercise and all. You never get tired. If you're tired going, you're not tired during the game. Something happens. Instead of taking a pill, I guess it's so, something else happens and all that. Once the people come in and start talking to you, you forget about whatever it is. Softball games yeah. and touch them. I just can't say enough about him. There are people in this world that you meet that are special. I've told people he is one of the finest human beings I've ever known and I just admire and respect him. Yeah, you'll be a big star. Pirates president Frank Coonley is a big fan of Phil's too. What I think about is dedication, commitment, and love of what he's doing. And it really shows, and we celebrated his 90th birthday on the field by presenting Phil with a Pirates jersey with the number 90 on it and his name, and it was a thrill to give it to, as he says, a fellow Irishman. The Irishman and everyone else have plenty to be excited about this season. I know I will wear this to school tomorrow. The atmosphere in the ballpark is completely different. The excitement is completely different. Great job. Those buildings are a great backdrop, but the most important structure out there is the scoreboard. For the first time in 20 years, the Pirates are celebrating a winning season. I'm going to tell you something. Win or lose, winning is better. Add up the years of experience. Add up the you can't count that high. <laughs> <laughs> you can't count that high. Better and beyond enjoyable for these ushers who have seen so much over the years. We made it at Forbes. 
We made it at Three Rivers, and now we're making it at PNC. And who can't wait to see what happens next. We have to, do, we have to win at PNC. We, win at PNC. we won at the other places. The guys here today, they are coming around. They are going to be great. Yeah, Alvarez is, uh, he's going to be great. McCutcheon's going to be great. We got young pitchers. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. And the only thing I can tell you, it was such a thrill. I tell my grandsons. Whew. Be patient. Give them time. And when they come here, I let tell them to look up there. I saw 60, 71, 79. Their time will come. Just like everybody else, I'm hoping and hoping and hoping. And uh, I told Mr. Coonley I'd light a candle <laughs> every week. And this week, this year, that's it's working. At St. Paul's Cathedral, you light yeah. a candle every week. For the Pirates. Those are tears of joy, tears of anticipation, and tears of appreciation of all it's meant to be an usher and a part of Pirates history. As far as planning this long term, no, I never, ever give it a thought. I never, I just was, I'm here, I'm doing it, and next thing I know, all this time's going by. Not like Milwaukee. What do you mean not like Milwaukee? I like sports, and as long as my health is good, I'm gonna keep on liking it. I don't think I'll be around 95 like Phil. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, I love it. I enjoy it. Well, I'm glad you're able to come. Mainly, I love it because I love people. I enjoy people. I like to interact with people. It's great. It's a good pastime. You guys need any help? And I, I do have customers that will say to me, Guy, they'll see my name tag. How long have you been doing this? And at first, I find it a little difficult to answer, but now I just answer it. I said, uh, since 1948, and they'll look and say, well, you've got to be kidding. I said, no, I've been at all three ballparks. I've been very fortunate. Waiting for Dorn Lane, who's just taking over the... Yes, they settled back in a few moments ago, but this ball is way back in goal. The camaraderie, you know, it means a lot. I, yeah, I loved it. He's a legend. Anything right. else you'd like to say? The legend of all the action no. that we have here. <laughs> Come on, I'm legend. Get, I'm getting ready to go. Get <laughs> ready to go. Be ready to wipe them seats. He's anxious to get in. Right. Somebody tell me I take my spot. I'd better get <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>